Tonight's talk today is titled, The Great Divide, Why the Karakoram and Himalaya Mountains Show Different Hydroclimate Signals. And before I jump into the research, people in the very back in the blue shirt, um, I have a hearing problem, so sometimes I don't notice if I'm too quiet. Hopefully the microphone's enough, but if you can't hear me, you can wave wildly like this, please. <coughs> okay, getting that out of the way. Um, so I'm very I was very interested in this region of the world, the Karakoram Mountains versus the Himalayas. Um, I've given you a nice picture if you don't know about this region. The Karakoram sits on top of the greater Himalaya range. Um, it's, at, it's at the corner of many different countries, it's Pakistan, China, um, India. And then you also have it um, in conjunction with the Himalayas feeding many major rivers of the world. Um, mainly the Indus here. <coughs> so from a climate perspective, um, it really, it's, uh, water resources are a major part of this region um, and a big focus of it. <coughs> so today, I'm going to go through what's so special about the Karakoram, why did I study it. I'll go through the tools that I use to look at it using model simulations and observations. <coughs> I'll do some validation of the seasonal cycle in the models. And then we'll really di dive deeply into how seasonality and physical factors lead to different climate responses in these regions. <coughs> so to start, what's so special about the Karakoram? So I started to give you a little bit of overview. The Karakoram, which is right here, is the high mountain range in Central and Southern Asia that borders these three major countries, and also into Afghanistan, is the highest concentration of peaks over 8,000 meters. So it's one of the highest locations in the world, and it's also the most glaciated out of the high latitudes. <coughs> Yet it's a very tiny region, and it's bordered by the Himalayas to the south. It also sits at a location where it receives winter westerly moisture flow as well as moisture from the Indian monsoons. So it's a region that gets two different major moisture streams during different parts of the year. <coughs> the Himalayas get the Indian monsoon and also the Southeast and East Asian monsoon. So really this region of the world is uh, in the middle of three different major streams of moisture that come into it, which then leads to different climate effects. <coughs> so, so why even bother looking at changes in hydroclimate in this region? So from the perspective of snow, 
this region is very important for what is going to happen for changes in snow in a warming climate. This is from a paper from Barnett in 2005 in Nature, which took a land surface model to model snow differences in snow um, pack and its contribution to runoff in the region. So these numbers are a percentage of snowfall um, to the runoff ratio in the region. The red lines give you regions that are stream flow dominated um, by snow melt and also don't have adequate reservoir storage. So if they have natural reservoir storage that's in the form of snowpack, they don't have physical reservoirs to capture the snow melt. And then the black lines are water availability um, is dominated by snow melt generated upstream. So even though in these regions snow doesn't fall, the water resources in the region are still dependent on snow. So the Karakoram and the Himalayas are right through here. And they end up contributing to the water resources in a greater area outside of them. <coughs> so understanding the hydroclimate changes in snowfall, snowpack in this region is very important for understanding the changes to water supply and water resources in the region. <coughs> um, so the Karakoram pops out as a region that is very unique across the mid-latitudes. Um, in this paper that I wrote on doubled CO2 effects on the snowfall globally, you find a general pattern in the northern and in the southern hemisphere as well, that you actually have increases in snowfall in the high latitudes. Um, under double CO2, but you have reductions almost everywhere outside of the high latitudes. One of the regions that pops out that actually does not have a reduction is over the Karakoram. You have this very strong positive signal. <coughs> and so with the talk that I'm giving you today and the research that I did on this, I want to really dive deeply into why this is that you have this positive signal over the Karakoram. So a popular term uh, relating to glaciers in the region is the Karakoram anomaly. So studies of glaciers have shown that across most of the Himalayas, glaciers are reducing in length and size. However, um, and so this is a picture actually of the Atta Glacier, which in 1933 came all the way to this part of the frame. You can see the glacier going up into the mountains and the valley. And then in 2006, all you have left is some small remnants of snow, but the main glacier is actually way back in the back of the frame. So across most of the Himalayas, glaciers have been receding over this time period. However, the Karakoram glaciers are unique in that many of them have stabilized and some have actually been documented to increase in um, size. So this is actually uh, length changes from 1840 to present. These are Eastern Himalayas to Central Himalaya to Western Himalayas, and most of them are receding quite a bit during the entire time period. You get to the Karakoram, and you, have, you do have some receding, but you also have kind of stagnation in some of them. And in one of the glaciers in the study, you actually have the glacier increasing in length. And so the Karakoram um, anomaly was uh, coined by Hewitt back in 2000 five to explain uh, to, or to state that this is very anomalous across the world, that these glaciers have not been declining. <coughs> so to understand why glaciers would change in size, you need to have the basics of math of glacier mass change. So I apologize if there's any glacier scientists. This is very simplified. The simplified part of glacier mass uh, balance changes is that your change in your glacier size is dominated by what's coming in versus what's going out of the glacier. So what's coming into the glacier uh, is snow, snow that turns to ice that then can be formed into the glacier and that gets included into the glacier. And then you subtract out what melts off, um, what happens through sublimation as well. And then you have, also have ice removal through calving, through avalanches. So if you have a positive glacier mass balance, your snow versus these terms is more positive. If you have a negative mass balance, these terms are much more negative than what's coming in. 
<coughs> so why don't we know what's ca causing the Karakoram anomaly? Why was this uh, a big question of why these glaciers were changing? Part of the reason is that the, it's very difficult to calculate changes in these glaciers um, to get all those terms in the glacier math. And so mountain glaciers are remote and harsh environments. They're not really easy to get to. Um, and so they also don't lend themselves easily to long-term weather measurements of snowfall, temperature, and precipitation. <coughs> also, for the northwestern uh, Himalayas and Karakoram um, in particular, they're especially unique because of their multi-country fabric um, and contentious and disputed borders. So in northern Pakistan, if you read the world news, you have Taliban uh, controlling certain parts of it, you have certain tribes, and you can't really get to some of these locations, even if you wanted to go look at them or set up stations. <coughs> you also have, as I said, the especially rugged terrain. So this region is extremely small, but it has all the really high mountain peaks, all the 8,000 meter peaks, so it's really hard to get there. <coughs> and for many of those high elevations, helicopters can't necessarily land when you get there. So for some of the people that want to do station or do measurements, it's very hard to get data out of those locations once you get people there. <coughs> Um, and so as a result, putting this all together, um, the observations that we do have in the region are year-to-year -year sizes of glaciers. They're measurements that have been taken when people have been able to go there at very specific time points. They're not continuous. <coughs> um, they're of meltwater runoff um, that's further downstream. Um, and they aren't really necessarily <coughs> the individual meteorological components that could be contributing to glacier change. So this is a summarizing table of a bunch of different studies that have been done in different parts of the region um, with temperature studies. And part of the problem is that if you pull all these temperature studies in the area together, um, you get the pinks are all positive changes in temperature in different, different seasons or over the entire year. Um, and the stars know it's statistically significant. So some studies say that it's warm but not statistically significantly. And then you also have these studies that say, oh, it's positive and it's negative. We're not really sure. Some stations give one signal, some stations give the other. So looking at the available weather stations that are in the region, also mainly at lower elevations, they don't give you a clear signal of what's happening over this region. <coughs> if you look at the precipitation data that's also available, um, you also don't get a clear signal. So the not signs that there's no trend at all that's detectable. And then um, from the gridded data that's been made, you have positive, negative, or neutral changes. So there's also not clear what's happening with precipitation. So like a very good person who works at the GFDL, I say these variables um, are very hard to measure with the meteorological stations that we have. If you want to understand the meteorological forcing in this region and the changes um, that are happening to glaciers, we either need to wait for more observational data to be available. Um, but if we really want to look at it now, uh, like a GFDL modeler, I'd say we really need to look at the climate models that we have available to understand this region. <coughs> that it's a prime case that we don't have enough observations to really understand what's happening um, with the terms of the glacier mass balance. <coughs> so this pushes us into what sort of model simulations and observations do I use to be able to assess the climatology in the region. <coughs> so um, for precipitation, I took the tropical, the TRIM data, the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, um, a gridded satellite product, 25 kilometers. The most recent version is supposed to also include actually frozen precipitation, sleet, snow, um, not just rain. So they claim to have more of the precipitation products in there. I'll question that later on. <coughs> I also use Aphrodite, which is a new uh, precipitation product 
in Asia that's coming out of Japan. Um, they actually have gridded it to monsoon Asia. So they have data at 25 degrees daily resolution covering this region from the 50s until present. Each one of these individual dots is actually a station that they've added into their analysis to be able to create this gridded precip and temperature data. And then the white areas is where there aren't stations. So you can see that the coverage is good in places where you have lots of populations and even into the lower mountains, but then it gets more sparse. And so the data in this region has been extrapolated. Um, but it's a better gridded product than other products out there because actually Japan was able to get the individual country um, to give their weather station data to them to be able to make this gridded product. So they claim that it's one of the best precipitation products in the region. <coughs> I also was able to get station observations from the Pakistan Meteorological Department. And the, um, it's not on there, but it's also the Weather Authority of Pakistan. So I have a Pakistani collaborator um, who now works at Oak Ridge, um, who actually has access to the country data. And from that, we were able to get 10 weather stations um, at various, these are the high elevation stations and the lower elevation stations in northern Pakistan to be able to assess the climatology. <coughs> the model that I use for the analysis is the GFDL CM 2.5 model. So you have, if you haven't heard about it, it's our high resolution global climate coupled model. It's based on CM 2.1, the previous model that's been used for in CM 3 and CM 5. <coughs> it's a 50 kilometer resolution, has 32 atmospheric levels, um, when you go to the higher resolution horizontally, you need to add levels for the radiation scheme. And then in the ocean, you have a much higher ocean resolution as well. Using this model, I've run an ensemble uh, from 1861 to 2100, five members, using RCP 8.5. So it's the highest warming pathway. <coughs> um, so in past studies of CMIP, there hasn't been a lot of research on precip and temperature, uh, on um, snowfall. And part of the reason for that is that you need to get both temperature and precip right to get snowfall right. Um, so we're very proud of the CM 2.5 model because um, from this study from Knudy that was um, analyzing all the different models, we gave him CM 2.5 to put it against all the CMIP 5 models and it comes out being the second best on one of his metrics for temperature and precipitation in the historical. And so CM 2.1 was pretty good, and the CM 2.5 does uh, even better. So you want to be as close to zero as possible. So it gets temperature and precip variability uh, very well and higher than a lot of other models, which um, gives us comfort in looking at the snowfall information, which you'll see in the validation that I'll do. <coughs> So I divided the region into three different uh, separate regions to be able to do my analysis, uh, combining over each one. Region one is the Karakoram, region centered over northern Pakistan. Region two is the central Himalaya. And region three is the southeastern um, Himalayas. And it goes a bit into the Tibetan plateau. Uh, these regions correspond, to, I don't have the picture here, but it corresponds also to the regions of the highest snowfall in the region. Uh, snowfall bands very closely with elevation. <coughs> so the reason I use CM 2.5 is it is a global model that I have access to that's the highest, also the highest elevation possible um, and higher resolution than the CMIP 5 uh, models available with historical data over this time period. Um, of 1950 to present to be able to explore snowfall variability over the region. So here I explain why the uh, elevation differences from resolution is so important. So the CMIP 5 model mean has 200 kilometer resolution average. Um, and I've shown, so I show CM 2.5s. Um, these are all histograms of the elevation um, with elevation on the x-axis. Uh, so we have CM 2.5 
uh, mean ele elevation histogram, team at five mean, and then I have an observed really high resolution product. So in the CARE quorum, uh, CM2.5 tracks much closer to the observed elevation distribution than the CM5. But actually, in the central Himalayas, um, it, it tracks well, but it, the difference is much less. And the reason for that is the central Himalayas is really more of a step function. You go from very low elevation to very high elevation. It doesn't really matter what the resolution of the models are to be able to get that step function. You still get it. <coughs> it's much harder in the Karakoram where you have a much more undulating uh, res uh, topography. And so then region three is actually kind of, kind of in between the central Himalayas and the Karakoram. It has a more gradual gradient than central zone, um, but and so it has some improvement um, in CM2.5, but it's not as severe as the tracking that you see in the central Himalayas. <coughs> so the um, the changes in topography matter a lot for the resolution's ability to get the topography. So this then shows up in our analysis when we're looking at the reproducing the seasonal cycle in these th three regions. <coughs> so using the Pakistan data as a case study, we have the high elevation points that are, that are the dark ones, low elevation points, which are the open circles um, in this map. And then those translate to the high elevation stations in green and the low elevation stations in gray with CM2.5 in blue. And so here we're looking at the seasonal cycle of precipitation. So what's really interesting is that at these low elevation stations, they have a very strong monsoonal signature that they're getting the majority of the precipitation during the summer monsoons. At the higher elevation stations, however, there's more of a winter high precipitation. So the maximum occurs during the winter months. And then there is some monsoonal um, signature, but it's much less so. And these stations um, are at very high elevations, but they're not at the highest elevations of the region. Um, and so there's actually been studies that have shown that there is a very strong precipitation lapse rate in this region and differences in the seasonal cycle as you go to elevation. And so we think that CM2.5 is nicely really capturing the fact that in these high elevation regions, you should be getting this high winter maximum instead of a monsoonal signature that you see at low elevations. Um, <coughs> something I forgot to mention when I showed the plot of all the regions is that I'm averaging for the model data at all the regions above uh, 2,500 meters. So I'm not averaging in the gray boxes. I'm trying to capture the highest elevation climate signatures. So I'm not interested in what the seasonal cycles are at the low elevations because they're often, as this shows, very different from that at the high elevations. <coughs> so if we here then take that, it's not in the legend, but if we take the observed precipitation that we see, now we add in those gridded products of Aphrodite and Trim, and we compare them against CM2.5 and CM, uh, CM at 5 mean, we find that for the precipitation seasonal cycle in the central Himalaya and the southeastern Himalaya, they all have very similar um, signatures. You have a very strong monsoonal, summer monsoon precipitation signature. Um, Aphrodite and Trim have also had that signature, but it's much lower. Um, and there's known biases in Aphrodite in terms of they're probably a little bit too low in this region because so they don't get enough precipitation at the high elevation regions. <coughs> if you look at the Karakoram, um, you have a slight shift between CM2.5 versus CM5. That you have a, a more winter signature in CM2.5, which is also much closer to what we see um, in the station observations that we have from Pakistan. <coughs> you have a slight bands of that in the gridded products, um, 
But the gridded products are really bad in this region. They're not really getting a lot of precipitation. And if you remember from that very first plot, there was a lot of white in that zone. So that zone is one of the least, um, has the least coverage of meteorological stations that go into the Aphrodite data. <coughs> but overall, the precipitation across all these is fairly similar. Where the seasonal cycle really diverges, however, between CM5 and CM2.5 is in temperature, particularly in the Karakoram. So the elevation error was the greatest in the Karakoram region um, between CM5 and the GFDL model, and with the CM5 having much lower elevations. And so this is really important for the temperature seasonal cycle because with elevation, higher elevation is much colder. And so CM2.5 is significantly colder than CM5. And it tracks much closer to the station elevations if we regrid them to be, if we um, lapse rate adjust them to being the same elevation as the uh, CM2.5 elevation. So it re it, you get a very strong difference between these models in temperature. Less so in um, southeastern Himalayas, you do have a difference. But that was where the in-between um, the central Himalayan Karakoram in terms of elevation error. And then when you have the least elevation error, they almost track each other perfectly. <coughs> so temperature is really different in the Karakoram region in these models, which then translates to differences in snowfall and rainfall. So while we found that uh, total precipitation in these zones was very similar, across all regions in the seasonal cycle and magnitude, you find significantly less or less rainfall in CM2.5 and CM5 mean. <coughs> but then where you start getting outside of the range of CM5 is when you look at snowfall. And because of those temperature errors, the temperature errors translate the total precipitation into major snowfall errors. And so you have more snowfall in the high resolution model in the Karakoram, in the central Himalayas, and in the southeastern Himalayas. So this really matters for understanding the uh, climate sensitivity of snowfall in the region. Because if you're not getting enough snowfall, and the snow is happening in places that's already really warm, you're going to have a much higher climate sensitivity to any additional warming. So the temperatures. Um, in the CMIT-5 model, are very close to freezing, whereas they were much colder in, um, in all these zones in the high resolution model, which leads to more snowfall and also leads to a much colder climate that can withstand more warming than can the other models in CMIT-5. <coughs> so we're fairly confident um, that given the validation analysis, we're getting right results in CM2.5. We're getting results um, in the historical seasonal cycle that makes a lot more sense. So, you, so with our comfort in that, we then go on to look at the climate change experiments. So how does that seasonality differences, how do they end up translating to changes in the climate change signal? So this, is, this section is now just CM2.5 data, just the data from the GFDL. And what we've, I've done here is I've taken the five ensembles. So each of the ensembles is one of these light squiggly lines. And then the ensemble mean is the dark line. Um, and I've now calculated significance um, at the 95% um, using um, the first 40 years of data. We calculate uh, what the base state is. And then we use this 10-year low-pass digital filter mean of all the ensembles put together to then determine when, um, when the signal then diverges from that. So these hatch marks are when this, the change in each one of these individual things, um, individual variables, differs from its base state. So for all of these variables, you have um, precipitation and temperature is all statistically significant and increasing, with precipitation being able to be detected um, in, the f in the much later part of the century than temperature. 
So the temperature is easily detectable, which has been shown across the world. We find this in many different places. Um, another notable part of this also is if you look at the Karakoram, it's significantly colder than the, rest, than the other two regions. So it starts off colder as well. <coughs> if we then look at the transient climate change in snowfall, this is where we see a reproduction of the glacier Karakoram anomaly. We have a snowfall Karakoram anomaly. So in the Karakoram, on an annual basis, we actually don't have a signal in changes in snowfall over the region. Um, it's actually statistically insignificant, but there actually is a positive trend. In these other two regions, there's a negative trend in snowfall that's detectable. <coughs> so we have positive temperature, positive total precip, but then no trend in snowfall. So with those three things, it doesn't really reveal what's going on in Karakoram. Why are you getting this increased snowfall despite the fact it's getting warmer? Um, if you also look at rainfall, interestingly, rainfall has a positive signal, but it's much, much earlier than the total precip um, signal. And part of the reason for this is that rainfall can increase by two mechanisms. It can increase by an increase in total precipitation, so the total amount of water in the sky falling. And it can also increase by a change in the amount of precipitation that's falling as snow versus rain. So if it's warm enough and there's more, um, it's warm enough, even if there's no change in the total amount of rain falling, or water falling from the sky, it's warmer, more is going to fall as rain versus snow. So this very strong signal in the annual basis of rainfall suggests that perhaps uh, the reason snowfall isn't changing is there's significant increase in total precip, but there's enough that snow isn't changing, um, even with rain changing dramatically. Um, so this wraps all those back together. Um, if we look at what's happening um, with the winds and as well as the, an uh, the annual distribution of precip, the, you have the arrows for the winds at um, 850 uh, millibars, and then you have the colors are for the percentage of annual precipitation in a given season. And so similar to the maps that we saw of the seasonal cycle in the Karakoram, you're not getting a lot of precip uh, during the summer months. It's on these more purples. You're getting the majority of the precipitation during the winter spring months. <coughs> However, in these other two regions, you have a much higher signal that's ha occurring during the summer monsoons. Um, and so th these regions are more dominated by the summer monsoon precip than they are by the other seasons. <coughs> and if we take storm tracks, uh, tracking low pressures of this going into the region um, from NSEP reanalysis, you have most of them originally in the winter passing through and hitting the Karakoram, and then in the summer systems, your summer systems predominantly are coming up um, to the Himalayas from the south. <coughs> and so these two regions are experiencing very different meteorological conditions, which are forcing their uh, precipitation changes. So if we then look at how the seasonal cycle changes in time, it helps us understand what's driving that neutral to positive um, snowfall anomaly over the Karakoram. <coughs> So this is a plot I developed. This is a new way of looking at the seasonal cycle in time. It's like a hob molar plot. On the x-axis, you have the years. And the y-axis, you have the months. Um, locations that have dots are not statistically significant. Locations without dots and without lines are statistically significant versus the first 40 years of data. <coughs> so across all of these three regions, you actually have statistical significant gains in precipitation. And most of them are centered closer to the summer and spring. So the Karakoram has some weak um, monthly total precipitation gains. Central Himalaya has very strong gains during the summer monsoons. And the eastern um, Himalaya have, and Tibet, have um, some gains during the spring into the summer. 
If we then look at snowfall, however, it's the opposite um, finding. You have extreme losses in the eastern and central Himalaya, and you have statistically insignificant losses in the Karakoram. But you also have statistically insignificant gains during the winter. So in central and eastern Himalaya, which we saw on an annual basis, have extreme losses. Um, those are mainly coming from the summer months. <coughs> so the snowfall signal is at odds on a monthly basis versus the total precipitation signal. So you're having losses in snowfall in these two regions, but you're having gains in total precipitation. <coughs> the reason for this is if we go to changes in temperature, um, the colors that are pink and red are above freezing. So you're having massive losses in snowfall, central and eastern Himalaya, due to warming during the summer. So previously, it was very close to freezing. Uh, but in these climate change analysis, you're finding that it's becoming above freezing much more often um, during the summer season. <coughs> now, the Karakoram is also experiencing that, but to less extent. So it's still much colder in the Karakoram during the entire year. <coughs> So this is the translation. The uh, temperature changes map well with what's happening in terms of the snowfall changes, in terms of the negative losses. Um, if we also look at this by elevation, it gives you some indication that even though this region has similar elevations across it, you have different signals. So now the y-axis has been changed to elevation. And I've banded the grid cells into these different elevation zones. And so actually, you, in the Karakoram, you, you do have statistically significant changes when you look at it by elevation. The lowest elevations are having snowfall losses, and the highest elevations are actually having snowfall gains. The rest of the Himalayas, though, predominantly, are having complete losses of snowfall. Um, and then this is interesting because this actually this doesn't map to what's happening with total precipitation. So total precipitation in central and eastern zones is actually increasing, uh, as well as in the uh, Karakoram. But it's not translating in these two zones into increases in snowfall. So there's more water falling in the sky at these elevations, but it's falling as rain. It's not falling as snow. <coughs> um, oops. Forgot my little fancy things. Uh, so if we go to elevation changes, um, or changes in temperature with elevation, again, we see that even though these zones are, uh, these regions have similar elevation, um, if, they, like, if you look at the similar elevation bands, you don't have the same changes in temperature across those elevation bands. So at the lowest elevations, they're getting really, really warm on an annual basis. But um, in the Karakor in particular, it's still staying really cold at the higher elevations. So even if you're having increases in precipitation at the highest elevations during the summer, in the central and eastern zones, it's not translating anymore into snowfall. It's now too uh, warm in these regions. Just a yes? question here. So why is Kirkholm so much colder than the other places, even at the same elevation? So I was going to mention that next. Uh, okay. But it's I can mention it now, too. It's because the um, going back to the pictures of where the flow is coming from, the Karakoram is getting most of its moisture and is mainly dominated by the wind flow in the winter coming from the west. And so actually, that, those temperatures are much colder coming from the west than they are coming from the, um, from the more southerly basins. And so there's less of an influence of that warm air from the summer mon even in the summer season during the summer monsoons. Um, and so it's, it's the luck of the location, being further north and being in the middle of that westerly flow um, versus these other regions that are more dominated by air masses that are coming more southerly from them. <coughs> um, so we went through this. <coughs> uh, so this is another way of viewing this on the uh, 
um, seasonal and also on the elevation basis, what is the participating in snowfall versus rainfall during the season? Um, because before I was showing you absolute values of what were the changes in snowfall, this is actually the percentage of the total precipitation. So in the central and eastern regions, we're seeing complete loss of snowfall during the summer months um, towards the end of, end of these runs. Whereas in the Karakoram, even though it's warming up, since it hasn't warmed up as much, um, you have less of that. <coughs> and you still have the winter months are predominantly snowfall dominated. Um, but if this trend continues, you can imagine that this region is kind of here in the central Himalayas. But if you continue to have excessive warming that drives um, changes, you might translate more into this later on um, past our runs. But that's purely conjecture. We haven't run it out that far. <coughs> and then on the elevation basis, similar thing at the extreme highest zones. Karakoram has stayed cold enough that almost all the precipitation falls with snow in those regions, whereas it's a much different picture in the central and the eastern Himalayas. <coughs> uh, if you then look at rainfall as well, I think it's interesting to show that because of the increases in precipita total precipitation, so the total amount of water falling from the sky, and the fact that it's warming that's causing a uh, difference in the partitioning of the precipitation into more rainfall versus snowfall, you get actually get across all months and across all of the elevations, we're finding statistically significant increases in rainfall in all these regions across all the bands that we've looked at. <coughs> so the rainfall s signal is detectable everywhere. Um, for those of you that are curious, um, this takes the uh, seasonal cycle that you're used to seeing. So these were the maps, that, the plots that were shown versus CM2, uh, versus CMIP5. Um, snow is black, total precip's red, rainfall is blue. Um, so you see a strengthening of the monsoon in these models with significantly more uh, total precipitation and rainfall towards the end of the century. And it's pretty much all the, to all the precipitation is rainfall, especially during the summer months. And even in Karakoram, you have increases in rainfall. And the, the distance between snowfall and total precips of so sort of a precipitation difference is growing. So you're having loss of snowfall at the expense, or increase in rainfall at the expense of the snowfall. <coughs> um, also, another way to look at this is um, why haven't we been able to detect this? in the observation studies that have been looked at before. So the observation studies, uh, many of them started around 1950. Using the model um, here on the left, I've changed the base period length. So I've changed the number of years since 1860 that we used to calculate the base period. On the right-hand side, I shift when the base period end period is. And so using this, this is a sensitivity analysis of can we find annual um, signals in snowfall and rainfall and temperature, and when did those signals emerge? And so from this, I think the most important thing is really to look at these columns, is the fact that it's the signal is detectable for total snowfall, uh, for snowfalls with percentage of total precipitation, uh, and for temperature and for precip and rain, much earlier um, than it is for snowfall. And Precip. So these things are much more detectable much earlier on than snowfall and total precip are. So using the meteorological observations alone that have been available, um, you're more likely to be able to find the temperature signal early on using the data that we have available. But since we don't have really long records of these other variables, it's really hard to find a signal. <coughs> and also, we never find a detectable signal on an annual basis for snowfall for the Karakoram. <coughs> so the Karakoram, without being able to do this um, analysis at the elevation scale and the monthly scale, you never find a signal, a uh, statistically significant signal in the region. <coughs> so to summarize, um, the seasonal cycles are very uh, different and distinct across all these regions, particularly in the Karakoram versus the rest of the Himalayas. CM2.5 does a reasonable job 
of capturing the aspects of the seasonal cycle and, the, and also validating care quorum, particularly with temperature um, when compared with CMET 5. And this, in turn, is really important for getting the right snowfall and rainfall. Uh, the differences in seasonality and the physical factors, so just the location of where the care quorum is, makes it less susceptible to these changes because it's not dominated by the summer monsoons. It's dominated by the much colder winter westerlies um, for its precipitation cycle. <coughs> Make it uh, less sensitive to radio forcing changes in terms of its total snowfall values. So these factors all together provide evidence that there's a meteorological carrot core anomaly. The reason the glacier anomaly exists may be due to the differences in the meteorological forcing coming from the differences in snowfall due to climate change in the region. <coughs> so that's all. Open for questions. Okay, so Yeah, I'm going back to the question that Edmund raised before. When, when you look at the, uh, the change temperature around the, the, the Karakoram, the, the temperature changes go as much as like minus 20, like I'm assuming the base, the base year would be 1850. Mm -hmm. So that then would mean the air mass coming from Europe should be getting colder. Oh, those pictures weren't anomalies for temperature. They were actual temperature. Sorry, they were anomalies for the precipitation, they, or for the water values. They weren't anomalies for temperature. This was actual temperature. So it goes from negative 20 to above freezing. So it, so it's just really cold. So you're, the air mass is, yes, coming across Europe, the Middle East, into the Karakoram region. Um, and it's also, at that time, also rising in elevation significantly. So temperatures in Europe aren't negative 20, but the high mass of air gets to be that cold so coming across. Okay. What increases the amount of snowfall then? So the, there are these storms that are coming through the total precipitation in the region is increasing. And the reason is that there, you're having an increase in precipitation across all the zone that is coming from the west. So the precipitation is increasing during the winter, in these winter westerlies in the Karakoram. And because it's cold enough, that's translating to more snow. In the monsoon regions, in the central Himalayas and the southeastern Himalayas and Tibet, that is dominated mainly by summer precip. And in that region, their total precip is also increasing. However, because it's too warm and it's happening during summer, it's much more susceptible to that change in temperature. So snowfall is reducing dramatically. <coughs> I should have made that clear. Ryan? So I'm just curious uh, with the increased precipitation, is that because, uh, I mean, you did some storm tracks. So are there fewer storms in the future? They're just with more moisture? And so we didn't dive really deeply into that, um, but the average precip, but it's just the average precip is going up across all of them during that season. Okay. But you don't have an idea of the number. So there seems to be a fair number of storms <laughs> slowing in that region, but you don't know if it's decreasing or increasing. So, so the interesting thing is not all those storms produce precip um, that are coming across. Uh, and my collaborator has been looking at that right now. Um, but I don't want to give away his results. <laughs> They're very preliminary. <coughs> so, uh, in the recent papers, they showed the, the Pakistan is still flooding, mm -hmm. the frequency is increasing. Do you think there is something related with water? Yeah, so I'm, I have a follow-up paper that's looking at changes in the hydrology in the region. Um, <coughs> So one of the important things to know about um, snowmelt dominated regions is that uh, when you get, when you do end up getting the rains in the summer, um, in a lot of these regions, 
the rain on snow causes much more rapid melt of the snow melt. So if you have the same or more snow pack, the amount of snow that's up in the mountains, and then you end up getting rain on it, you end up melting it much faster than if you didn't have the rain. And so it's causing changes in the runoff cycle. <coughs> There are. <laughs> there, we have a student looking at that right now. Um, but the, it's interesting that the precip, where the precip increases start, it, you start having losses eventually up in parts of the desert. So it doesn't translate to pure increases across the whole region. It's due to the, it's due to the circulation, which uh, may also be slightly model dependent, especially as you go further up.